Thank you, Lucas. Um, okay, so um, yeah, we're going to talk about coroutines today. Um, let's see. If, yeah, so yeah, this is me. Uh, Lucas mentioned most of this already. Um, you have not seen me uh, a lot uh, in this uh, in this meetup uh, in the last couple of months. That's because I've been mostly working behind the scenes, uh, like taking care of uh, all the technical stuff uh, behind the streaming. But uh, yeah, be assured I was always there in the background. Um, so what is the motivation for this talk today? Um, so coroutines are hard, right? Like if, if you ever tried playing around with them, you might have noticed that there's quite a steep learning curve in, in getting started with them. Um, so on the one hand, they allow for extremely complex transformations of control flow, um, but they do so using an arcane syntax that changes some of the fundamental rules of the language quite drastically. Um, that makes them really hard to understand, but what is probably worse is uh, it's also really hard to remember all of these uh, special rules when you're not using them regularly. Um, so like when, when I first picked them up, I like learned how they work and then I didn't use them for uh, a couple of weeks. And when I uh, came back later, I noted that I had forgotten almost all about how they worked. So the idea of this talk is to not just give an, an, an introduction into the language feature for people who have never used it before, but also to do it in a way that uh, helps you remember it easily later on uh, if you haven't been using them for a while. Unfortunately, the feature is too big to introduce it all at once. Um, so this talk really only focuses on the bare essentials uh, of the uh, language level mechanism. Um, like how the, the the syntax works and what the uh, what the essential components are. Um, so this is the overview of the talk today. We will start by briefly looking at some essential use cases for coroutines. Um, then we will um, talk about how uh, the caller, like the user of, of a library, for example, sees coroutines. Uh, we will go through the steps that are involved in starting a new coroutine. Uh, then we will look at suspend and resume, which is the, the most important feature uh, of coroutines. Um, and then we will try to draw a map of coroutine land that helps us um, keep track of all the different pieces. Um, and then we will use that to um, actually go through some essential use cases uh, for how we can interact with coroutines. Um, so a little disclaimer up front. Coroutines are extremely powerful and flexible, as I've mentioned. Um, because of that, for didactic reasons, uh, I'm going to simplify things quite a lot in a couple of places. Uh, I'm going to ignore some of the more advanced features uh, in order to keep the explanation streamlined. Um, and yeah, please keep in mind that all the code that you're going to see on the slides is very much slide code. Uh, it's meant to illustrate a specific purpose and explain specific relationships in a simplified way, but it should not be taken uh, as uh, advice or best practices for how to write coroutine code uh, in the real world. Um, another thing to note is that uh, what we are going to look at here today um, is very much the, how uh, an implementer of a library would uh, use coroutines, right? So if, if you want to write your own library, that exposes coroutine types um, to your users, then you're going to need what you see today. Um, if you just want to make use of a library that already provides coroutine support, chances are that you're not going to need most of what you see here today. Um, so um, in particular, if you use a library like ASIO, that's probably the best example today. Um, it's, it's much easier than what you see here. Um, but unfortunately, uh, as of today, we don't have a lot of uh, library support out there. The standard library um, really only has a single coroutine type that will only be introduced with C++23. Um, so for the moment, if you want to play around with them, uh, you will pretty quickly be exposed to the internals that, uh, that you're going to see here. Uh, so I hope this will be a good introduction to that. So with that out of the way, uh, let's look at some of the basics. Um, so what, what is a coroutine? Um, essentially, you can uh, think of it like a function that can be paused in the middle. 
um, and execution can be resumed later. Um, and the, the, the important property is really that, that when, you, when you resume the execution of the coroutine, all of the surrounding state is still intact, right? So you, you really, what you, you suspend execution right in the middle of execution of function. Uh, and when you resume later, you're going to resume at the exact spot where you left off and all of your surrounding state is still, uh, is still the same as it was. Um, a consequence of this is that the coroutine is always stateful, right? Because uh, when, you, when, when you are going to suspend, you somehow need to remember uh, where, you, where you left off and what, what the state of all the surrounding local variables were. Um, so unlike a function, um, a coroutine always has this state uh, associated with it. Um, and that needs to be created and, and stored somewhere. Um, so when you actually think of calling a, a coroutine, even though it looks like a function call, uh, you should think of it more like uh, calling a factory function um, that will be constructing this uh, this coroutine state, right? It's, so it's it's really more like a like a factory for a function object than a, a traditional function call. Um, the last thing to keep in mind is that uh, the coroutines as we have them in C20 today are stackless coroutines. Um, and what that means is that when I'm going to sus suspend from a coroutine, I always suspend back to my immediate caller. I cannot have uh, additional functions uh, on, the, on the call stack in between. Um, if I want to do that, then uh, each of those intermediate functions need to be a coroutine as well. Um, and I need to do um, sort of the um, uh, suspending through the stack. I need to do all of that manually, uh, which is not the case in uh, a lot of other uh, programming languages that uh, provide coroutines. So this is uh, this is an important restriction to keep in mind. Um, so let's look at a basic use case. Um, one of the um, things that are most often mentioned here is asynchronous computation. Um, so at the top here, you see like a, a simple uh, example for a, a blocking I.O. library. Uh, so imagine you want to read some data from a socket. Uh, in the blocking case, you would just call the, the read function, uh, would give it uh, a pointer to a buffer that you want filled. Um, and then as a result, it would return you an error code uh, and the number of bytes that were read. Um, so this, this allows for um, like a pretty straightforward way to, to write code based on this library. Um, but of course, <clears throat> it's not, it's not a, a very efficient library, right? Because um, all of your IO calls are now blocking um, and your thread will spend most of its time just waiting for the read to complete. Um, so what you would want to do instead is have an asynchronous API, um, which would look like what we see here at the bottom. So instead, of um, getting the error code and the uh, number of bytes read back as a return value, we now pass as an additional argument to the function a callback, and then the return values will actually be passed to that callback. Um, so a consequence of this design is that you get this weird inversion of control flow, right? Because um, the, the async read call is going to return immediately, um, and when you actually want to process the result of the operation, that will happen in the callback, right? So you wake up in this completely different context where uh, now like all the surrounding state um, that was happening when you scheduled the read is no longer there. Um, and that makes this, uh, this style of coding quite challenging to write, uh, especially if you're not used to it, right? Like if, if you do this for a while, then eventually you will get the hang of it. Uh, but in the beginning, it's um, yeah, it, it it can be quite tough to um, to deal with this paradigm in a complex code base. So what coroutines now allow you to do is um, they remove this inversion of control flow. So um, what you see here in the second call, that is how it would look like with coroutines. Um, so you simply co-await on the asynchronous call, um, and then again, as as in the blocking case you will get the return values uh, back as the return values of the function. Um, and the, um, 
in, in terms of execution flow, this is still the same as we had in the other example, right? So when you reach the call wait, you're leaving the function context, right? And it will only be woken up again once the result of the operation is there. But uh, because we can, uh, we can write the function like in the same way as we did in the blocking case, and because the coroutines take care of restoring all of the surrounding state when we wake up again, um, this makes it much, much easier to write um, than uh, in the callback-based approach. Second use case uh, that you often see is uh, where you have um, this uh, sort of uh, lazy or delayed computation. Um, so like you might have a coroutine that starts some kind of computation um, and then it will just at, at some point it, it will just stop and then you have to provide more data before it continues and like you gradually provide more data and with each uh, with each time the coroutine executes a little bit further, might return some partial results until in the end it has finished, uh, it, it has finished processing. Um, so one uh, particular special case of this pattern uh, is the so-called generator, um, which is uh, what we will look at in our first example. So imagine you want to write a simple function that just generates a series of numbers. Like I, I've chosen the Fibonacci numbers here as an example. Um, and if, if like the, the first interface that you might come up with um, for solving such a problem is the, the signature that you see here. Um, so it's simply you call the function and you get as a return value back a vector that contains um, the entire series that you asked for. But this design has some disadvantages, um, as you might already see. Um, so the first one is it requires linear amount of storage, right? Um, so if we're asking for n numbers, the vector needs to be resized to hold all of those n numbers at the same time. Um, and in a lot of cases where you uh, want to work with uh, such a series of numbers, you actually don't need the whole series, right? Like in, in many cases, you just process one number after the other and, and do something with it, but you don't actually care ab uh, about having the full series available at once. So in this case, um, it's uh, the, um, the amount of memory required here is, um, is unnecessarily wasteful. Uh, another problem here is that this interface doesn't really allow you to work with uh, infinite or unbounded ranges. Um, you need to know before you call the function, like what what is what is your your biggest uh, your biggest n that you want to uh, that you want to go to, like what what is the maximum size of of the range that you want to iterate. And in some cases, you don't know that upfront, right? You might only find out while you're iterating through. Um, so let's take a look at, at a more flexible interface. So this is a, a, an alternative approach. Um, instead of returning uh, the generated series in a vector, we're just returning a generator object. And this generator object has a, a next member function. And with each successive call to that next function, it will give us the next number from uh, the series. And um, if, if you see an interface like this, and I asked you to implement something like this, even if you've never heard of coroutines, you would probably be able to do this. Like you don't even need C++ 20 for this, right? You could implement this interface uh, with C++ 98 even. So is, is this make feeble generator function now, is, is that actually a coroutine? Um, and the answer is like, we don't know. It, like whether or not the function is a coroutine is an implementation detail of a function. And there's no way to tell from the outside um, whether it is a coroutine or not, right? It, it could be implemented just in the, in the classical way, um, like you would do it in C++ 98, um, <clears throat> but it could also be implemented as a coroutine. Um, the, Important thing that the user cares about is, is really only this, uh, this return type that we see here, right? So as, uh, as a user using a, a, using a coroutine, you don't actually need to know 
any of the implementation details. The only thing that you need to care about is the return type and its interface. And if you understand that, you know everything that you need to know to use this function. Uh, and the fact that it's implemented as a coroutine, you don't really need to know that and you don't need to care. Um, so since this is the only thing that, that the user will see, if we now set out to implement the make fever generator as a coroutine, um, the very first thing that we need to look at is this return type and how it works. So as, as we've said in the beginning, um, if we think of the coroutine as a factory function, right, then the very first call to this function will create this return type that we hand back to the user. Um, and the interface of the return type, that is the entire interface of how the user can, can interact with the coroutine. Um, the client really doesn't need to know anything else besides what is in this interface. And there's really no special rules here, right? Like this return type, it will just be a type like you've seen on any other function and there's nothing special about it, right? Um, and since we as the implementer of the coroutine decide what this return type looks like, um, we have full control over the interface and we have a wide range of possibilities what kinds of interactions we allow. But now this design begs the question, <clears throat> if we cannot tell from the signature of the function whether or not it's a coroutine, then what actually determines whether it's a coroutine, right? Like what turns a function into a coroutine? How does the compiler know that a specific function is a coroutine or, or just a normal function? And the answer is <clears throat> it, it's a coroutine if either of these three keywords appear in the body of the function. And that's, that's it, right? If, if the compiler finds any of those three keywords in the body, it's a coroutine and all of the special coroutine rules apply for compiling it, um, which has quite some drastic consequences for how the body is, uh, is interpreted by the compiler. Um, just one sim simple example, you see here the co-return keyword, um, and that replaces the well-known return uh, keyword from normal functions. You cannot have a normal return uh, in a coroutine that will be a compiler error. You need to actually use the co-return instead. Um, so if we think back to our uh, generating Fibonacci number example, this is what the body um, of such a function would look like. So you may notice that this is very similar um, to what the body would look like for um, the naive interface where we just return a vector, right? Uh, only that instead of the vector pushback, um, we here do a, a co-yield for a for saving the results with each iteration. And this is very much by design. Um, so <clears throat> the, in, in a way, the, um, the function that returns the vector is sort of the most simple way that how, how you could, um, how you could uh, write such a function. Um, and the coroutine allows you to use that same simple structure um, for the uh, more complex approach where um, you have a generator object return. In the case of the Fibonacci numbers, the difference is not that big, but if you think about more complex generators um, or also iterators where you have to traverse complex data structures, um, it actually makes a difference pretty quickly. Um, so another thing that you might notice here is that if, if you read this like you would read a normal C++ function, you will encounter a couple of things that don't really make much sense, right? Um, for example, we see that the return type here is a FIBO generator, but there's no FIBO generator object anywhere to be seen in the body of this function. And there's no return statement that would return such an object. So where does this go, right? And that, that, that's just one example for like how uh, we have special rules that are being applied here to the coroutine. Um, and it's the goal of this talk to um, walk through like what these special rules are and how this now actually works. So let's try to start by implementing the smallest, most simple 
coroutine that we can think about. Um, so this is what I could come up with. The, like, the function body cannot be empty, right? Because it, it needs to have one of the three keywords, otherwise it's a function and not a coroutine. Um, but we can just insert an empty return statement, right? That's, that's basically the coroutine equivalent of an empty function. Um, and that's, that's, the, that's as simple as you can get. Um, so this is all that we need for the, for the coroutine body. Um, so now we need to define what the return type is, right? Um, so again, let's try to start here with the simplest possible thing that we can think about. Um, let's start with an empty type. Um, and now actually, for the first time, we'll get a compiler error. Um, the compiler is going to complain here that it is looking for a promise type, uh, type def or nested type inside the struct, which we did not provide. Um, so yeah, okay, let's do that. Let's again do the simplest thing that we can do to get rid of the error. Let's just provide an empty promise type. Um, we could also use a type def here, but I'm going to do it in line to keep the keep the code as streamlined as possible. Um, and now this promise type, that's actually the second important participant in the coroutine mechanism here um, that we're going to look at. So why do we need this, this promise type? What, what is its purpose? Um, so if you think of the, uh, the return type that we give back to the caller, um, it, it kind of works like a, like a future in the threading library, right? It's, it's something that we give back to the caller and then um, like the caller can uh, use this to like wait results or uh, resume the coroutine or whatever. So it's, um, it, it's sort of the interface that the, um, the, the caller can use for interacting with us. Um, now, in, if, if you think of the, the future promise library in, uh, in, in the threading library, um, the, um, the counterpart to the future that is given to the user is the promise which resides within the producing thread, right? So promise, uh, that is actually where you will put in the value that the thread produces, which will then resurface in the future on the other side. Um, and here it's, it's, it's sort of similar in that um, if the return object is what you give back to the caller, then the promise that is what resides within the coroutine. Um, but don't take this analogy too literally because like this is about where the similarities end. Uh, so besides from this like conceptual similarity, the promise in the coroutine is very different from uh, the promise in the, in the threading library in the future promise context. Um, in particular, one thing that is special here is that this coroutine promise is something that gets constructed by the compiler in the background. This is not an object that we actually have lying around as a variable in the, in the function somewhere. Um, it gets constructed in the background, it's stored in a magical place and you can only access it indirectly. Um, the promise is sort of the central intersection point um, uh, between the, the coroutine context and the caller context. Uh, and we will see how that works in detail later in this talk. Um, it also uh, determines what happens at essential points in a coroutine's lifetime, uh, as it offers um, some uh, customizable functions where we can execute code that then gets executed, for example, at the start or the, um, the completion of execution of a coroutine uh, or uh, how an, an exit via co-return or via an exception from the coroutine is handled. So let's look at the implementation of this thing. Um, if we just start with an, uh, with an empty type, we will again get uh, a bunch of compiler error messages that uh, some stuff is missing. So let's just fill them in as um, uh, as the compiler will complain about them. Uh, the first thing that we will need is the get return object function. Um, and you will notice that um, the return value of this function is of the same type as the return type of the coroutine. Uh, what happens here is that when the caller calls the coroutine for the first time, uh, the compiler will automatically construct the promise 
uh, and then call the get return object member function on the promise to construct the return object that will be returned back to the caller. So this is the reason why we didn't see that before in the body of the core routine, because it actually happens here inside the promise type. Um, the next function uh, that uh, we will um, that we will need is uh, the function for handling the call return. Uh, and we can either have a function that handles a void return or functions that handle the return of values. Uh, in this case, because I, I started with a simple function that just had an empty call return, uh, we need to imp implement return void here. Uh, we don't have anything to do here, so we just leave the body of the function empty. Um, Next thing that we need is the unhandled exception function. So in case that we uh, don't uh, leave the, uh, the function through ordinary uh, control path, but leave it by throwing an, an exception, uh, we need a special function uh, that handles that. And that is this unhandled exception function. Um, and lastly, we have two more functions that we need to implement. And that's initial suspend and final suspend. And those allow us to execute code um, in case of the initial suspend, uh, the code that is being executed uh, at the beginning of the core routine and in the case of a final suspend, uh, code that is executed at the end of the core routine, that is like when either when the core routine returns through a core return statement uh, or uh, when execution falls off uh, the end of the block. We don't yet quite understand what those do. What those do. Um, but uh, we will get to that in a moment. Um, if we have all of this in place, though, we are at the point where we can actually compile our code and we can already see some of the stuff in action. Um, so let's start with a simple example. So again, this is my simplest possible coroutine. And I just added a print statement so that we can actually see what's going on. Um, and if I have uh, my initial suspend function uh, return std suspend always, um, as, uh, as I did in the, in the example before, we will actually notice that if we call hello coroutine, we don't see a print statement uh, on the console. So what happens here is the compiler uh, will, um, will call the coroutine. It will construct the promise call get return type. And then it will ask initial suspend what, what it should do, like if, if it should suspend. And in this case, uh, initial suspend says suspend always. So the coroutine will just stop executing before it reaches the body of the function. Um, and since we never resume it, it will just stay in this suspended state indefinitely. And we never see the message printed to the console. Uh, in contrast, if we just change the return value here from suspend always to suspend never, uh, we will actually see um, the, um, the message printed to the console. So in this case, uh, the coroutine body will just run all the way through um, and uh, it, it will not suspend. So it will just execute like a normal function. So how, how does this suspension now actually work? Um, and in order to understand that, uh, we will need to look at one more player, and that is the so-called awaitable. So what is an awaitable? Um, the simplest way to think about this is um, we, we have seen in the uh, initial example that uh, in, in, in a core routine, we often have this uh, co-wait statement, which are the places where we can actually suspend the execution of the coroutine. Um, and this call wait is an operator and it takes an, an argument to each, to each invocation. And the awaitable is simply a type that we can call call await on. That is, that is really all it is. Um, and what that does is each call wait call presents an opportunity for suspension, right? So whenever we call call await, we may suspend execution at that point and then be resumed later on. It's only an opportunity for suspension because like the, the awaitable can always decide to just continue execution right away without going to sleep. Um, but 
potentially that that's that's the point where the suspension might happen. Um, similar to how the promise provided these uh, hooks to execute at uh, like the, the start or the end of execution of the coroutine, the waitable provides hooks um, that are uh, that are executed uh, when we suspend or when we resume. Um, and in particular, yeah, it, it might decide not to suspend at all, but just continue execution. Um, so again, if we uh, if we try to call a call wait on an empty type, the compiler will complain. We need at least three methods here. Um, the first one is uh, the await ready function, which uh, simply returns a bool. Um, and that bool determines whether we actually take that opportunity for suspension uh, or whether we just continue executing. Uh, so if we are ready, that means we're not going to suspend. We're just going to continue execution right away. Um, uh, and if we are not ready, so if we uh, if we return false here, uh, that means we actually do go into suspension um, and control flow is returned back to the caller of the function. Uh, the next function is the await suspend function. Uh, that is the code that will get executed immediately before we are going to uh, be put to sleep. Um, so if, uh, uh, if uh, await ready, returns true, so we're not going to sleep, then await suspend is never called. But in the other case, um, await suspend is being called and we get passed uh, as an argument, uh, the coroutine handle to the coroutine that we're going to suspend. So this coroutine handle is something that we haven't talked about before. Um, it's a thing uh, from the standard library and you can think about it like a raw pointer um, to the um, to the coroutine frame, um, and we will look at its interface in detail in a second. One thing to notice here is that uh, the coroutine handle is a, is a templated type. Um, you can either use it with the uh, with the empty uh, template brackets, in which case it will uh, just be a, a type erased coroutine handle that can point to any coroutine, or you can specify a promise type here, uh, in which case you can only use it with coroutines that um, are actually associated with that particular promise type. But uh, for those handles, the interface will be a little bit richer. So again, this is the same promise type uh, as we've seen before. The last function that we need is uh, the await resume. Uh, and that is sort of the counterpart of the suspend. Um, this contains the code that will be executed right before uh, the coroutine resumes again, right? So if caller eventually resumes us, then first we will call await resume on the awaitable and only then return control flow um, to the body of the coroutine. And that's the entire awaitable. Um, so how do we implement this function? Uh, those functions? Well, in the simplest case, we just have uh, the await ready return true or false and leave the other two empty. Um, and if we do it like this, then that gives us actually exactly uh, those suspend always and suspend never functions uh, that we saw before uh, in, the, in the simple example. Um, so you see here the code for the suspend always. Um, if instead in the await ready you return true, you will get the uh, corresponding suspend never function. And then one last thing to look at, as promised, the coroutine handle interface. Um, so again, the coroutine handle, think of it like a pointer to the, to the coroutine frame. And if I say pointer here, I mean raw pointer, not smart pointer. This thing does not have RAII semantics. Um, what you can do through the coroutine handle is it has a resume function, uh, which allows you to resume a previously suspended coroutine. Uh, it has a destroy function uh, with which you can destroy a suspended coroutine and it will actually take care that it's properly destroyed. All of the uh, destructors are invoked and the, um, the respective memory uh, is freed um, correctly. And then lastly, it provides two conversion functions um, that allow you to convert from the coroutine handle to the promise type and vice versa. So that was now a lot of 
stuff. So let's let's try to put this into a little cheat sheet um, so that we can remember it later. Um, so the way that, that I structured this is um, I I wrote it down like the, the, the code that you that you would write down when you implement this. Um, and I chose the order in a way that it corresponds to the order uh, in which uh, things get executed by the compiler. Uh, and whenever you see a slash on the line, that means you either do the one thing or the other. Um, so here, for example, the first thing that you have to write down is the return type of the function. Um, and uh, you either specify this as a struct or if your coroutine uh, has a return type that is not a type that you control, you can also use the STD coroutine traits um, to, um, to specify the, uh, the, the promise type that corresponds to this. Uh, this is important, like, for example, that way you can uh, turn a function that just returns a plain int or even void into a coroutine. Um, but in most cases, you, you will have a, a custom return type. So that's that's the more common case. Then for the return type, the compiler determines the promise type. Uh, it will then, uh, when the coroutine is called, uh, the first thing that it will do is it will construct the promise in a magical place. Um, and uh, one thing that I haven't mentioned before, um, you don't have to, but you can, if you want, provide a constructor for the promise type. Um, and if you provide a constructor that takes the same arguments as the coroutine function, then that constructor will get called and the arguments that were passed to the coroutines will be forwarded to the constructor here, which is useful in some cases. Then once the promise type has been constructed, get return object will get called to construct the return object that will be handed back to the caller. Um, and after that, initial suspend uh, will get called to determine whether um, the coroutine should suspend right away. Um, and once that is through, the startup phase is completed and the body of the coroutine will, uh, will start executing. Um, similarly, once the body uh, of the coroutine has finished, um, we either have finished by um, returning a value with a co-return statement or by returning nothing or falling off the end. Uh, so uh, each case is handled by either the return value function or the return void function, and you cannot have both, right? You need to decide for one. Um, in any case, uh, there's always the possibility for exiting with an exception for which you need the unhandled exception function. Um, and then the final suspend, uh, which will get called um, after the body of the coroutine has finished executing, all of the local state has been destroyed. You get one last opportunity for suspension. This is the cheat sheet for the awaitable. Um, this is much simpler. And like I think that by looking at the names, you can probably still uh, remember what uh, each of those does. So await ready. Um, determines whether you want to suspend or continue executing. Await suspend is uh, called before suspension, and await resume is called before resuming. And with that, we have all of the key components in place. Um, so this was now quite a lot of stuff, right? Um, and it's not really important that you remember the exact interface of all of these, um, but Please try to keep in mind what the, uh, the, the rough roles of, of each of those types are, right? The return type, that's the user-facing interface. Um, and that is something that we can completely control and design as we want. Uh, promise type uh, is like this, this magical type that is created by the compiler, which has these customization points for uh, startup and shutdown. Um, at the awaitable, that's the, the thing that we pass to the co-await operator, um, and that allows us to control what happens when we suspend and when we resume. And the coroutine handle is uh, this, uh, this, this raw pointer to the coroutine state through which we can resume and destroy the coroutine. Um, and at this moment, like we don't really understand how all of these uh, parts connect. 
but that is what we will look like uh, what we will look at in the next step but before we do that i want to quickly pause and ask if we have any questions already on the stream yes indeed there are some questions um it goes back to slide 18 um, mm -hmm. but maybe you can just stay here i think it, it, this will be sure. relevant too um kilian asks so get return object is for co yield and return void is for co return right no 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 get return object is always called right it's so you you call you call the coroutine function right and the the interface of this function call promised the caller that you're going to give back a return object and get return object is where you construct this return object that you're going to give back to the caller. And you always need to do this, right? No matter what the body of the coroutine looks like, your signature promised a return object. So you need to give that back, right? So that's that that that, that always happens. Um, and what, what makes this a bit difficult to grasp is that this return object is not, th th there's no return statement that returns this, this return object, right? It's this is constructed by this call to this magical function in the promise. If you have a return or a yield statement inside the function, that, that's a different thing, right? Because by the time that you reach the co-return um, in the, in the coroutine, you might no longer be talking to the original caller, right? Like if, if, if you suspend in the beginning, if you just do an initial suspend, uh, like a suspend always on the initial suspend, Right, then like your caller calls you, constructs the coroutine, and the coroutine suspends immediately. Uh, and then when it e eventually resumes, you're in a completely different context, right? And you might be returning a completely different value than uh, what uh, was promised in the in the signature of the original coroutine. Um, so that's th that's an important uh, an important change here in how coroutines work. That um, is a bit challenging to wrap your mind around it first. I, I hope it, it's a little more clear. So just as clarification, this get return object is what creates the, for example, generator object, the very first. Exactly, like, in, in, like, exactly, like the FIBO generator in the uh, initial example that we had, the, the get return object would uh, create a, a FIBO generator, yeah. Okay, thank you. And then on slide 30, uh, Ronald asks, who owns the coroutine handle? Um, yeah, that is, <laughs> that's a good question. And the language does not say, right? This is, this, this is um, determined by how you design your coroutine system. So in 99% of the cases, I would say, um, the ownership is on the return type, right? Like you hand the caller back an object and the lifetime of that object determines uh, what the lifetime of the coroutine is, right? And that that is your one thing that controls whatever happens with the coroutine. But that's not the only execution pattern, right? Like you might have execution patterns, for example, where you have uh, an executor or a threat pool or whatever, and you decide that this external entity manages the lifetime of all the coroutines that are in the air. Uh, in that case, you would say that the coroutine handle is passed to like this central entity and that then manages the, the lifetime. But that is a pretty advanced use case. So uh, unless you have been playing with coroutines for a while, I would suggest you just like always have the return type manage all of this. And earlier you mentioned this is more of a raw pointer, right? Or you have to manually because if this return type is something we construct and de yep. design essentially, we will also have to do this um, bookkeeping and memory management. Right, right. So the, the yeah. So the, the easiest way to manage this is um, in the promise you say on the uh, on the final suspend you always say suspend always, right? Um, because if the if if you don't suspend in the final suspend and the coroutine like finishes execution the coroutine cleans up itself, right? If it just falls off the end and you don't suspend, it, it, it cleans up all of its stuff itself and the coroutine handle becomes a dangling pointer, 
right? If you then try to call destroy once it has finished execution, that's undefined behavior, which is bad, right? So what, what you want to do is you say in the promise type, just suspend always on final suspend, right? Like the body has finished execution, but you stop the core routine before it cleans itself up. And then in the return type, in the destructor, you just say destroy on the coroutine handler, right? And then, then you have a simple RAI style lifetime management through the return object. Um, and that's that's usually the, the, the simplest way to do it. Okay, then, then just as a last follow-up question, is this pattern compatible with like infinite or like um, things that don't return? For example, this uh, Fibonacci yes. generator yeah. Yeah, does yeah. not that, go that, off the end, right? No, that, that's yeah, exactly. That, that that's the thing. So if you like, if if your 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 coroutine is suspended in the middle, right, and you call destroy on the coroutine handle, it will do the right thing, right? So mm -hmm. that that's allowed. Okay, wonderful. Then with that, that's all the questions. Cool. Okay, then let's try to bring a little more structure into this and and make more sense of all these these different types that we've now seen. Um, so let's actually talk about resumption now. So we, we, we've seen a simple suspend case already, right? Like we, we've seen how we can use the initial suspend to keep a function from executing. But what I want to do now is instead of just have this, this simple call that doesn't do anything, I want to be able to call a resume function on the return object and that will then resume the coroutine. And then on the resume call, I will actually see uh, the print message being printed um, to the console. So how could we implement something like this? Um, so the resume method, that's just a member function of the return type. So that is something that we have to implement as the authors of the coroutine. Um, and as we have seen, the way to resume a coroutine is through the coroutine handle, because that's the only thing that, that has a resume function on it. So how do we do this? So if we look at all the, all the different parts that, that we had so far, uh, we, we get this picture, right? The caller always has access to the return type, because that, that, is, that is what we give back to it, right? Um, the coroutine on the other side always has access to the awaitable because that's the thing that we pass to the co-await call inside the coroutine. So they, they, they are naturally connected. Uh, and then we also saw that uh, through these conversion functions on the coroutine handle, we can always get from the coroutine handle to the promise and vice versa, right? Those, those two are like interconvertible through those functions. So, so far, all of these parts are otherwise disconnected. And now to actually make use of this, we need to make some acquaintances. So let's start by remembering that we had this get return object function on the promise type, right? Um, and as you can see from the colors here, this is actually uh, an association between the promise type and the return type, right? Because when this function gets called get return object, it's a member function of the promise type and it constructs the return type. So this is the place where we have both of those available. So one of the things that we can do here, and this is again, this is like the 99 in 99% in of the cases, this is what you absolutely want to do. We can use this function to pass the coroutine handle as a constructor argument to our return type, right? So we use this uh, the conversion function on the coroutine handle here to um, get the coroutine handle for this coroutine from the promise. The promise is like, since we're a member function of the promise, we can just get that through the this pointer. And then we just pass it as a constructor argument to the return type, right? This is a normal constructor call. Return type is just a normal type that we wrote. We just give it a construct. We just give it a constructor that accepts the the handle as an argument. And when we have that, 
our return type looks like we see here on the bottom. Uh, so we just add a coroutine handle member variable now to our return type. Um, and then just in the constructor, we save the handle that was passed to us from the get return object function. And now implementing our resume function that we need to make our example work is trivial because we just have to call resume on the handle that we stored in the constructor, right? That's, that's how we make this work. Um, and what is important to note here, when we do suspend on the initial suspend, we actually have to store the handle somewhere because otherwise our coroutine ends up in a suspended state somewhere and we cannot reach it anymore and then have no way of resuming it. So we either have to give the coroutine handle to some external entity uh, like some global manager or again, the, in the 99% case, pass it to the return type in this case. And this gives us the, the, the first additional association here, right? We, we now have uh, uh, the coroutine handle as a member variable in the return type. Um, and that's how we can get to the coroutine handle from within the return type. So how can we bring the other side into the picture now? So if we look at the awaitable, we again have a situation where um, we have uh, like two different types in the same function and that's on the await suspend call because the await suspend call gets past the coroutine handle uh, as an argument. And uh, if, we, um, if we chose to um, use the specialized form uh, of the coroutine handle, then we even get direct access to the promise type. And that gives us the missing arrow. And now our picture is actually connected, right? Now they, they, they all form one graph. We don't have any unconnected parts anymore. So how does this help us? How can we, how can we use this now to write some real code for coroutines? Um, so to get familiar with this, let's actually try to solve some simple problems here. And there's really two problems that I think are um, sort of fundamental. And if you know how to do that, then you can pretty much build all of the other things that you would want with, uh, that you would want to do with coroutines from scratch. And that is fundamentally, how do I pass data from the coroutine back to my caller? And the other way around, how do I pass data from the caller into a coroutine that has been suspended? If you can do those two things, then you can pretty much do everything else. So I think it's really important to understand those use cases. And let's try to use this, uh, this little map that we now have to make that happen. So let's start by um, looking at the um, passing data out of the coroutine first. So we start in the coroutine. We want to pass some data out. The only thing that we have access to at this point is the awaitable. So this is how this might look like. I'm, I'm in the coroutine F1 and I want to pass the number 42 as the, as the data that I want to pass to the outside. The only thing that I have, await, uh, that I have await, uh, available at this point is an await statement because that's the only way how I can hand the, um, the control back to my caller. Um, and the only thing that I can do with an await statement is pass it an awaitable, right? So I'm going to define an awaitable um, and it, it's, it's going to take the data that I want to pass out as a constructor argument and is going to store that just in a member of the awaitable. If I do that, the data is now in the awaitable. The next step now is I need to get the data down into the promise. Um, and as we can see here, uh, the, the path to do that leads through the await suspend method. So I'm now also going to add to the promise a member variable to, um, to add our data. And I'm going to use the await suspend method to pass the data through, right? So from the await suspend method, uh, I get past the handle as an argument. I use the handle to get to the promise. Uh, and then I store 
in the member uh, variable of the promise the value that are previously saved in the awaitable. And with that, the value is now passed down to the promise. And that takes care of the coroutine side, right? The await spend function has now finished executing. The coroutine is now has stopped executing. And now I need to retrieve the data from the caller side. And this is the path how I do that, because I need to get to the data in the promise. Um, the path to that leads through the coroutine handle. And this is how that would look like in code, right? So I've called the coroutine function, um, and now I want to retrieve the data that the coroutine stored for me uh, via this get answer member function. Um, and I implement this simply by um, going through the handle that we saved earlier in the constructor of the, of the return type, getting from the handle to the promise, and then the promise just has the data stored as a member uh, value, so we can just uh, we can just return it from here. That's the one side. Now let's take a look at the other side. How can I get data from the caller into the coroutine? So from the caller side, again, the path leads through the um, through the handle, right? So this is what that would look like. I, I have a coroutine. The coroutine now is going to co-wait on some awaitable. Um, and when it wakes up again, I want it to receive uh, some data that the caller gave to me, right? So caller is going to construct the coroutine. Coroutine executes until this co-wait outside answer statement and then goes to sleep. Now, return uh, control flow is returned to the caller. Caller does some stuff and eventually is able to provide this data, which in this case is again the um, int42. The, the int um, I call this provide function. I give it the data. Um, the data is now transported into the coroutine and the coroutine uh, will resume execution. Um, and the value 42 will get uh, assigned to this uh, the answer local variable inside the coroutine. So how do we implement this? Um, well, the provide function, you probably can already guess it. Um, again, as before, we use the handle member variable, uh, which we filled in the uh, constructor of the return type. From the handle, we can get to the promise. On the promise, we create a, a member variable to hold the data. This is where we store the value. Um, and then we call uh, resume on the coroutine handle so that the coroutine wakes up and continues execution. Um, could have also split the storing the value uh, and the resume part into two different functions. But in many cases, you, you want to do uh, both in, uh, in one function as we did here. So now again, our data lives inside the promise. Uh, how can we now get this out to the coroutine? So the only path that we have available is again through the uh, awaitable. So how, how does this work? Um, we are actually missing uh, one vital piece here. Um, so as we have seen before, um, on the await suspend function, we actually get the, um, the coroutine handle uh, as an argument. And the handle is really the, the only way, our only path into the promise. The problem is in the await suspend function, we don't have the data stored in the promise yet, right? So we, we are still in, like we just finished executing the coroutine, but we, we, we need to wait uh, for the caller to provide the function, right? Which has not happened yet uh, before we can actually start storing it. So at this point, even though we have the handle uh, available, we, we cannot do anything with it because the value has not been stored in the promise type yet. So what we're going to do is we just store the handle away in a member variable of the awaitable so that we can use it later. In the await resume function, that is executed now after 
the, um, the caller has provided the data and we have been woken up again. At this point now, we retrieve the handle that we stored earlier in the uh, member variable, use the handle to access the promise, and the promise now contains the data that the caller saved for us. And now the, the, the thing that we didn't mention before is the return value of the await resume function is now this, the return value that will also fall out of the overall co-weight expression when we wake up again. So this, this is our path back now, how we can hand data from the awaitable back to the back to the coroutine, right? It, it falls out if, if we look back at the example um, out of this co-await uh, statement for the outside answer, the return value of that is the same as the return value for the uh, await resume function. And that is how we pass the data out. Any questions about this point? There is one question from Roland and he asks, sure. I, I'm surprised that there are raw coroutine handles. Do you know why it isn't, why it is not created as something similar to unique pointer? Um, mostly because of advanced use cases, like the, so like this is, this is a very low level mechanism, right? Uh, and it's designed to be very flexible. And there are use cases where you just want the coroutine to clean itself up and you don't want the coroutine handle to clean it up. Like sometimes you want to do that. It's not very often, but sometimes you do. Uh, and if you give the coroutine handle uh, RAI semantics, that's, that's very hard to do. So what the, the, the way that the mechanism is designed right now, you don't ever need to look at the coroutine handle, right? You can completely ignore it. You don't need to store it anywhere and the whole thing still works. Whether that's the best design is debatable, but yeah, it, it's, a, it's a low level mechanism. They wanted to allow maximum flexibility, and this is what we now end up, ended up with. So, yeah. Has there been some progress in like offering a higher level abstraction? Because at the beginning, you mentioned that there is barely anything in the standard library. Yeah. Um, and it's been a couple of years, right? Coroutines were 17, was it? Uh, there were 20. 20, uh, 20 I mean, yeah. The, okay. the, TS, the TS has been around since since 17, but the, the, there were some changes between the TS and the, and the 20 version. Um, and yeah, but it's been a while. The problem is like the experience with the feature has been limited, right? It has taken a while for compilers to implement it properly. Um, and not a lot of people have been using them, right? So mm -hmm don't really have a lot of best practices lying around. And for a lot of the facilities, it's not clear yet what a good standard library interface would look like. Um, yeah, and I think like that's the main reason why we didn't, why we didn't see more library support for this. I mean, like the generator that we now get with 23, that's really the most simple type that you can think of. Um, but what, what you really want is, and what like some of the coroutine libraries that are out there try to provide is like a, a composable framework for asynchronous execution. And getting that right is a lot more challenging, right? I mean, you, you can always hack together a coroutine interface that works somehow, um, but that will not, probably not be a pretty interface that will, be an interface where you have a lot of repetition, you have a lot of different types. Um, you will keep rewriting like return types and promises and awaitables with minimal changes and composing different operations will be very hard. And writing a good interface where you don't have that kind of repetition and where you have composable primitives, that's a lot harder. Um, and that's something that I think like we, we yeah, this is also then a lot harder to standardize, right? Because mm. you now have these very abstract, very challenging use cases um, and getting those right is just, yeah, it just takes time. It's not something that you that you can just do 
like from from a single proposal. So all of this is quite low level, and even with this, like now we go with the more flexible approach. Yep. To try my understanding is to try to be as unopinionated as possible to offer many different use cases, diverse yep. use cases. Do you think it's feasible or like realistic to build higher level abstractions that still aren't opinionated or like not very opinionated? Yeah, sure, sure. You, you, yeah. Of, of course you can do that. It's just um, like you, you need <laughs> you need some experience with the mechanism, right? In order to do that, and like we have people that have done that and that have that experience. Um, but like if if you like let's say after this talk, you, you go away and you start writing your own coroutine code, you will very quickly arrive at something that works. Uh, it will be a lot harder to arrive at something where you would say, oh yeah, this is a really elegant design. This is something that scales. This is something that I can use in production, right? Um, and if you, like if, if, if you have worked with, uh, I mean, so it, I'm, I'm now only talking about the, the one use case, the, the most prominent one, which is asynchronous operations. Um, if you work with other languages here, in particular functional programming languages, um, like they, they have very elegant mechanisms for how to deal with this. Um, for other kinds of execution patterns, you, you you might not have that kind of prior art and you will have to find it find it out yourself um, again it's an extremely flexible mechanism you can solve a lot of problems with it um, and some of those problems might be simple enough that you you don't need the the super advanced stuff um, but for like what the the standard library was talking about it was mostly use cases like the asynchronous one right that, that that's the ones that are um, that are interesting enough that it's worth putting them in a standard library. Um, mm. And yeah, then th th that's where it gets difficult. Okay, thank you. Cool. Um, then we have one more thing that I wanted to mention, and that is how to yield values. If we think back to our um, example from the very beginning, what we wanted to do is uh, we wanted to just generate numbers and like with each uh, with each resumption of the coroutine, we wanted to give back a new number. Um, we can do that now from what we've seen by um, using the passing data out of the coroutine function mechanism. Uh, we would need to define an awaitable, call it new number awaitable here. We can pass the value to that and we can co-await on that and everything works. Um, however, the code that we saw in the very beginning was slightly different. It was using this co-yield statement. Um, and this co-yield statement, it essentially does the same as the, the, the co-weight-based code would do. Um, but it offers like one uh, important shortcut. So the way that this is resolved is whenever the compiler encounters such a co-yield statement, it will, it will look for a corresponding yield value function on the promise type. Um, and the signature for that function is as such that the value that we want to pass out of the coroutine is passed as an argument to the function. And the awaitable that we want to co-await on is returned as the return value of this function. So, in, in a sense, if we think of like starting out with this code where we co-wait on this new number awaitable code, we can turn this into that code that is based on co-yield by writing this implementation here, right? So this does nothing more than uh, uh, basically providing the name of the awaitable type automatically, but otherwise um, it's exactly the same control flow as in the other example. The useful shortcut now comes from noticing that when we call the yield value function, we are already in the promise type, right? Um, and the promise type, if, if we think back of the path, how we, pa how, we, uh, how we pass the data around, that is where we want the data to go. 
So instead of doing it this way, if we do a co-yield, we can also do it this way um, in that we just say the yield value function, instead of going through an awaitable, is going to store the data directly into the promise because we're already in the promise. And now we no longer need a special awaitable type because all we want to do now is go to sleep. So we can just use suspend always. So what this really gives us is a shortcut, right? If we use yield value, we can get from the coroutine directly to the promise without having to go through the awaitable. Other than that, it's it's not really that di that different from the from the co-await use case. So if you understand the co-await use case, that's that's actually the important one. There's one last thing that I want to talk about, um, and that is um, symmetric transfer. To understand that, let's again look at what the call stack for a coroutine actually looks like. So let's say we, we have a, a function somewhere, which is the caller function, right? That, that is being invoked. The caller function calls the coroutine. The coroutine now executes until at some point uh, it reaches a suspension point. Uh, at this point, the coroutine will suspend and the control will, get, will be handed back to the caller, right? So the coroutine is now off the stack. All of the coroutine state uh, is persisted in the coroutine frame. Um, and the, uh, the only way that we have to access this is through the coroutine handle. So the caller now wants to resume it. It will call, for example, a resume function on the, on the return object. Um, this will then invoke the resume function on the coroutine handle, which it has stored. And then uh, the coroutine will continue executing. And this is what our call stack looks like then until eventually coroutine will reach a suspension point again. And at that point, we again like roll back the, the entire call stack and control is returned back to the caller. Semantic transfer now handles the case where instead of returning control back to the caller, we want to hand control to another coroutine. So if we imagine again this case, the caller is creating a coroutine. The coroutine now reaches a suspension point. And now instead of handing a return back to the caller, we hand control back to another coroutine, which will now replace our original coroutine on the call stack and continue execution. So this is almost like a tail call in, in terms of what, what happens on the stack. Now, this other coroutine executes, eventually also reaches a suspension point and might again, via semantic transfer, handle control back to our original coroutine. And all of this happens without ever going back to the caller. This is a pretty powerful mechanism and it's surprisingly easy to, um, to get this behavior. Um, so what we would want to do is that in the body of the core routine, we have to co-weight on a, a special awaitable, I called it transfer here, um, that uh, allows this kind of behavior. And the way that this is done is on the await suspend function. Uh, if you think back so far, await suspend uh, in all of our examples had a return type void. If instead, the uh, await suspend returns a coroutine handle, then this uh, the, the coroutine pointed to by this handle, that is the coroutine that we will transfer to. So the way that it works is, and that's what makes this a bit confusing here, we have two coroutine handles now on the, uh, on, on the signature. The coroutine handle that we get passed as a parameter, that's the same that we had before. That is the coroutine where we come from, right? That is the coroutine that called the co await. That is the coroutine that is about to be suspended. The coroutine handle that is the return value, that is the coroutine that we want to transfer to, right? So this is another coroutine that is already in the suspended state and we, Get, we, we have saved that handle like from by 
means of some earlier execution. And if we now return this, then we're going to resume this execution and transfer uh, control to it in this symmetric way. So for this to work, the promise already needs to have this coroutine handle saved from, uh, from by, by, some, by some other means. Uh, but then if we have that, uh, we, we can simply invoke it. So like, for example, what we could do here is we could say, if we have uh, that coroutine handle set in the promise, then we're going to transfer control back to that coroutine. Otherwise, we just continue execution ourselves, right? That might be a, a typical pattern that we want to do here. Um, and what this is useful is, for example, we could use this to implement uh, time uh, a kind of cooperative multitasking uh, between different coroutines without having a central scheduler, right? Um, if the coroutines all know each other and they all know like who they uh, would like to pass control to, um, they could use this to, to schedule each other directly, which makes this pretty powerful. And that's actually the last thing that I wanted to show today. Um, so what we've seen today, it was a lot of syntax, it was a lot of technical stuff, but really this is all you need uh, to write your own coroutine code. So uh, if you're curious, if you want to like play around with this, write your own library that makes use of this, these are all the essentials that you need and everything else, all the more advanced stuff follows from, from these fundamental principles. Learning the syntax here really was the easy part. Um, it's a lot of stuff to get through in the beginning, but none of it is particularly complex understand how to use all of this effectively is a lot more difficult, but also a lot more fun. So like, if you understand this, then the boring stuff is now behind you and you can start like playing around with, uh, with the real stuff and dig into the real fun. Um, as I quickly mentioned before in the discussions, designing libraries around asynchronous control flow is a very deep topic. Um, it's very challenging, and I really hope that we will see many talks about this in the future, because from the coroutine talks that we have seen so far, most of them have been focusing on the, the, the technical details, the implementation details, and not really much about the usage. And uh, I really hope that we can change that in the future. Um, for now, I hope that like this little cheat sheet that we created will help you getting started and will also help you remember how to use them when you're picking them up again. Um, so here it is again, um, this uh, describing how the, the return type and the promise interact. This one describing uh, what the awaitable looks like. Um, and then what I think is probably the most valuable, the little diagram that shows uh, how they all connect and how we can pass data around between them. Here's some references for you. Um, and I also have uh, put all of the uh, all of the cheat sheet on a single A4 page uh, with this QR code. Um, you can uh, actually access uh, uh, the, um, the download link for the cheat sheet where, um, yeah, you can download the PDF, print that out if you like, pin it over your monitor. And I really hope that that will help you in writing coroutine code a little more easy in the future. And with that, thank you very much. And I'm happy to take any remaining questions. So thank you for this wonderful talk and this great overview. Um, I'm not seeing any further questions um, mm -hmm. so far. So maybe let's wait one second and see someone is just still typing. Sure. Um, but anyway, so yeah, there's some thanks um, in the chat. If there are, assuming there are maybe no more questions, um, if maybe you have a question that's uh, more detailed or you want to ask the Andreas directly, we will be having an after talk chat right now, just to post the link in a second in the Twitch chat and just can click on it and join us. Okay, and also says thank you very much for this talk. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I think there are no more questions. Okay. 
Und das ist sehr gut. Dann Tony, auf der Tablet. Ja, machst du da? Cool. All right, then. Yeah, thank you, everyone. And Have a good night, night, day, afternoon. <laughs> okay. Bye.